So we're going to talk a little bit about Newton's law of gravitation. Newton was kind of an interesting individual. Uh, was around about the time of Galileo. And about the time of Galileo and Newton, we sort of shift our, our focus in science from one of simply collecting and analyzing data to one of trying to explain why things happen. So sort of theories for uh, how and why uh, things might happen. Uh, before that, remember Tycho collected data, Kepler analyzed data. We were trying to sort of explain what uh, was going on or what the data was telling us. And now we're sort of taking that step as a civilization to talk about so why are these things happening? And so I call the time of uh, Galileo and Newton sort of the two-year-old stage of science because now we're finally to the question or to the point where we can start asking the question why. One of the things that Newton did was he was he's credited with being the person who uh, sort of stated that the laws of physics here on the Earth are not unique, that uh, whatever the laws of physics on Earth are, they must be the same everywhere in space. And I think that if you're going to try to ex understand the universe, that you almost have to make that kind of an assumption, because if you assume the rules are different out elsewhere in the universe, then you can't hope to figure out what's going on out there. You can only hope to figure out what's going on here. But if the laws of physics are consistent here and throughout the universe, then once we understand something here, we also understand it for every other place in the universe. As you saw in earlier videos, he discovered what we call his three laws of motion. And as we're going to talk about in this one, he also uh, discovered, uh, came up with a law for gravity. Interestingly, when he came up with those three laws, he actually also came up with the, a fourth law, his law of gravitation, that we're going to talk about. When he took it to his contemporaries, he had four laws of motion, and somehow those got down to three, and then a law of gravity, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Newton did a variety of things. He uh, was credited with building the first reflecting telescope. The telescope that Galileo built was made all out of lenses, and so it was a refracting telescope. Newton's design incorporated a mirror, and mirrors reflect light, so it was called a reflecting telescope did several things with light, came up with what's called the particle model of our corpuscular theory of light, and may or may not have invented calculus depending on uh, which historians you believe. It's kind of uh, contentious as to whether Newton or Leibniz actually came up with the calculus, and I believe that the debate right now is leaning towards uh, Leibniz probably uh, should get more of the credit than Newton. The story sort of goes that Newton is sitting out in an orchard uh, and an apple falls, uh, didn't hit him in the head, that's a, an urban legend, uh, but fell near his location and it started him to thinking, you know, he said that if this apple falls to the earth because of this force that I call gravity, why then doesn't the moon, which is really just a big apple, which is kind of silly because everyone knows the big apple's in New York. It's nowhere near the moon. The moon is made out of cheese, except no, we sent people there in the 70s and we found it's just a big rock in space. There's no intrinsic food value to the moon at all, just a big rock in space. But if gravity affects this apple and causes it to fall, why then doesn't gravity act on the moon and cause it also to fall? And so he's thinking about this problem and he starts thinking, well, you know, if I take that apple and instead of dropping it, I throw it just a little bit, it's going to travel a little ways and then it's going to hit the earth. And if I throw it a little harder, give it a little more velocity, it'll travel a little further before it hits the earth. And if I keep throwing it harder and harder and harder, giving the apple more and more initial velocity, eventually there will be a time where if the earth is perfectly round and doesn't have any uh, mountains or anything, uh, perfectly spherical, doesn't have any mountains or anything, I will eventually have to duck because the apple will come back around and hit me in the head. And so he theorized that the reason that the moon didn't fall towards the earth, even though it was acted upon by gravity, uh, was because it was traveling with the velocity. Now remember, he's coming up with these three laws of motion, and the first law of motion says that 
An object travels with a constant velocity unless it's acted upon by an unbalanced outside force. And so gravity is a force. Uh, this force happens to be perpendicular to the velocity. And so what it causes the, the moon to do is to turn uh, consistently. And if the velocity and the force are just right, uh, you get yourself an orbit. So he's reasonably sure that he's figured out that, that gravity plays a role in the moon going around the Earth. Aristotle, by contrast, would say, uh, for Aristotle, the universe was a natural place. And Aristotle would just say it was the moon's nature to go around the Earth. For Newton and for Galileo, the universe became a causal place. Things happened for a cause. And Newton called this cause gravity. And so he's sort of thinking about this, this force of gravity. And remember, he's got these three laws that he's going to be taking to his, his contemporaries to peddle. And he has, has to build in, you know, the third law that says if one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal force in the opposite direction on the first object. And so he sort of thinks about things and he decides that uh, the way that this gravitational force must therefore work is that two bodies attract each other with a force that is proportional to the mass of each body. So neither body is... Uh, alone separate both bodies come into play and that way if you reverse the two bodies uh, you get the same same amount of force uh, and it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them he theorized that he would have to throw that apple with a lot of velocity to sort of get it to go around the earth without crashing into the earth because it was so close the force of gravity would be stronger that out further away the force of gravity would be weaker uh, and so he built in this this distance relationship as well. So proportional to the force of gravity, proportional to the mass of each body, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance, and he called this as his law of gravity. Now when Newton took it to his contemporaries, they said, Newton, have you lost your mind? They said, you know, look, here's the earth, and there's the moon. There's not anything in here. There's nothing connecting these two objects. There's no big pole or string or spring or uh, chain. Nothing connecting those two objects. And since they're not connected, there's absolutely no way that those two objects can influence one another's motion. That is, they were very uncomfortable with an idea that we kind of take for granted today, and that idea is called an action at a distance. Two objects without any direct physical contact can possibly uh, impact or change one another's motions. And so uncomfortable were they with this idea with a, of an action at a distance that they said, nope, you're wrong, sorry, uh, try again. We'll take the first three laws, but this law of gravity of yours is, is absurd and we're, we're not even going to think about it anymore. Uh, and Newton uh, said, you know, that... that you're wrong. And they said, uh uh. And he said, uh huh. And uh uh huh. -uh. See, we're at the two year old stage of science. And Newton finally said, uh, after some time, it wasn't an, an immediately, but after some time, he went back to his contemporaries and said, You remember that those, those Kepler's laws of motion? And they said, Yeah. And they said, uh, And you remember that third one about the square of the sidereal period of orbit and the the cube of the semi-major axis, and they said, yeah. And then he said, did he tell you why that was that way? And he said, no, that's was a really weird thing. He wouldn't tell us why. He said, I was just trying to explain what the data seemed to tell us. And Newton said, well, I can tell you why. And he was able to show, using his law of gravity, that for planets going around the sun, that uh, if you used his law of gravity, you could show that the square of the sidereal period of orbit of a planet around the sun was indeed proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis of orbit. In fact, when he got, by the time he got done, he was able to show that not only was it true for planets orbiting the sun, but it was true for anybody orbiting another object. So moons around the Earth. Uh, moons around planets, uh, binary stars orbiting one another. It wasn't just relegated to stars with planets because, again, we weren't relegated to a single data set. We were now working with mathematical models. 
Once he was able to show his contemporaries that he could explain why Kepler's third law was the way that it was because of his law of gravity, they grudgingly said, okay, I guess it's right, but I really, really, really still don't like this idea that these two objects don't touch in any way. And so what they did, they came up with an idea that we still use today. They said, okay, what we're going to sort of picture is that the Earth, by virtue of possessing mass, and in fact any object by virtue of possessing mass, changes or creates in the space around it a gravitational field. And they literally f envisioned this gravitational field as sort of an invisible, jello -y like subject. Uh, a substance that would wobble and so if the earth moved that would cause the invisible jello to wobble uh, and then the invisible jello would, would uh, touch the moon and cause it cause it to move the way that the, the there is no invisible jello the way that the 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 field lines work first off gravity is always an attractive force so the gravitational field always points towards the object that is creating the gravitational field and also uh, gravity gets weaker as you move away from a body and so that is sort of indicated in this diagram by the lines getting further apart as the lines get further and further spaced apart uh, gravity is getting weaker and weaker and as the lines get closer and closer together gravity is getting stronger and stronger mentioned when we talked about Kepler's laws that Kepler's third law gave us as a people uh, the first sort of idea of at least relative size scales within the solar system. Newton's form of Kepler's third law actually allowed us to calculate distances uh, how many miles or how many kilometers uh, it was from the Sun to the Earth and so forth. It also gives us the ability to calculate masses and in fact the way we calculate for example the mass of the Earth is that we have a moon that orbits the Earth. We can figure out how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth. We can figure out how far away the moon is. And using that information with Newton's form of Kepler's third law, we can actually calculate a value for the mass of, of the Earth. It's not that we've ever put the Earth on a balance. We've used this uh, natural satellite that we have, the moon, uh, to help us figure out the, the mass of the Earth. And that's actually the way that astronomers prefer to determine the mass of a planet is they like to look at the mass of a or they like to look at a body that is orbiting that uh, planet that doesn't work with Mercury and Venus because Mercury and Venus have no moons I have to resort to other met methods there but he finally convinced his contemporaries that this law of gravity had to be correct so he came up with this gravitational field and everyone was was kind of happy uh, the way that uh, the law works and don't let the mathematical equation mess with you too much we're not gonna use the equation uh, a lot to do calculations we're gonna use it more to do mathematical reasoning than anything else but basically if you have two objects one of which has a mass m1 and the other one has a mass m2 so this would be the mass of body one this would be the mass of body two and d is the distance between the objects is actually the center to center distance between the objects then the gravitational force is the depends on the product of the mass of the two bodies. It's inversely proportional to the square of the center to center distance between the two objects. And then there's a constant of proportionality called big G, Newton's universal gravitational constant, which in our units has this value right down here. Now you may notice this exponent right here. It's a 10 to a negative power, it's 10 to a negative 11. 10 to the negative power means that you have a small number. 10 to a negative 11 means you have a very small number. Uh, the gravitational force is a very weak force. Out of the four fundamental forces in nature, gravity is the weakest. The other forces are the electromagnetic force, uh, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. But gravity is the weakest of those. And in order for us to actually experience or be able to, to feel a gravitational force, we have to be in the vicinity of an object that has quite a bit of mass, something like a planet or a moon. Um, it is actually true that while you're sitting next to a person, uh, they exert a gravitational force on you, but you can't really feel that force because of the very weak nature of the gravitational force. Mentioned that the distance between the objects is center to center distance in astronomy. 
the distances are always given as center to center distances. So if you look up, for example, the distance from the Earth to the Moon, that distance is center to center distance. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is center of Earth to center of the Sun. The gravitational force, because of the distance squared being in the bottom of the relationship, is what we call an inverse square law. Inverse because distance is on the bottom, so it's an inversely proportional. That is, as the distance goes up, the force goes down. That's an inverse relationship. And the distance is squared, so that's why the square is there. So inverse square law. The force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects. So what the heck does that mean, and how, is, how can we use that to figure out some things? Well, let's suppose that we want to answer this question. An astronaut doubles their distance from the center of the Earth, and we want to know what happens to their weight when they double their distance from the center of the Earth. Well, we might write, that, uh, write a pair of statements down here. The distance is going to do something by a factor of something, and in response, the weight of the astronaut is going to do something by a factor of something. So let's talk about distance first. If an astronaut doubles their distance, then their distance is going to increase. And if their distance increases, or distance doubles, their distance is going to increase. And it's going to increase by a factor of 2. Double means to become twice as large. So the distance increases by a factor of 2. Notice that there are two blanks. And there's also two words in the phrase inverse square from inverse square law. And we're going to use those two words to help us figure out the words that go in the next two blanks. So the first word in inverse square is inverse. And the second word in inverse square law is square. So the inverse of increases. If we want to do the inverse of increases, that means that it decreases. Remember, gravity gets weaker as you get further away from an object. So you get closer, it gets stronger. As you get further away, it gets weaker. So the inverse of increases is decreases. So inverse helps us figure out the word that goes in the first blank. And square helps us figure out what goes in the second blank. We start with the factor that comes down. So we're going to start with that 2. But then we're going to square the 2. 2 squared is 4. So if we double our distance from the center of the Earth, our weight decreases by a factor of 4. It's called the John Diet. You can use all the Twinkies you want. You just have to figure out how to double your distance from the center of the Earth. And that is Newton's Law of Gravity.